A good children's book, written by someone aware of their responsibilities, tries to follow the pattern of the mind when it's working properly. Very early on it will say, what if, and proceed with enjoyment and wonder to run through the possibilities resulting from that. The what if often entails fantasy, and it's over the element of fantasy that many writers get the wrong idea. They assume that because a thing is made up, it is untrue. That was Diana Wynne Jones in Reflections on the Magic of Writing, and this is The Red Pen. Hello, and welcome back to The Red Pen, where we cut up fiction to see what it's made of. I'm your host, Austin Chant. And I'm your co-host, Amanda Jean. Welcome back, Amanda. Thanks, Austin. Welcome to episode three. This time you're taking the reins again. I'm taking the reins of this charging steed. And I'm (laughs) taking it straight to Magic Town. Ooh, I want to go to Magic Town. Are you ready to make some magic with me? I'm ready, but that sounded a little romantic. (laughs) Well, I was going to follow it up with... I hope you are, because we're going to tear apart all the ways people have done it wrong and all the ways people could do it right, and it's going to be very intense. (laughs) There's so many ways to do magic wrong. As a frequent speculative fiction reader and, you know, an editor who dabbles in that too, oh boy. (laughs) Oh, that feels mean. (laughs) I don't want to be mean. A mean way to start our episode, which is actually going to be very positive. Remember, this is the podcast where we say nice things about people. I don't know how to do that, but we're gonna. We're gonna do our best. We are going to be talking primarily about one of my all-time favorite authors, uh, Diana Wynne Jones, who is a British children's author of uh, children's literature. Really? Wow, amazing. What? I thought she was a gritty, true crime writer. I thought, I thought that she wasn't a children's author after I said that she was a children's author. No, yeah, she's she's middle grade, you know. Yeah. It's actually funny because I, I don't think British children's literature divides itself up as much. At least that's been the impression, impression that I have. It just seems to all fall under younger people's books. People who aren't old enough to be reading all that dirty adult fiction. Yeah, the nasty stuff. As far as I know, Diana Wynne Jones has some dark stuff in yes, her, she in her books, and I'm, ex- does. I'm excited to talk about that and how the magic plays in, and how at the end of the day, these books are still primarily geared towards children. I don't know. I'm really excited for this episode, and I should state at the top that I haven't actually read any Diana Wynne Jones because I'm a heathen and shouldn't be allowed to walk <laughs> this earth. Um, I saw the Miyazaki film of Howl's Moving Castle, which I'm sure a lot of people are familiar with, and it's a beautiful film, but as far as I know, is quite different from the book. It and is I'm also very different. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about that because I love both of them. And I love them in probably my favorite way to enjoy adaptations as completely different properties. They share some aesthetics and some characters, but they are very, very different uh, stories. Yeah, uh, Diana Wynne Jones is one of my favorite creators and also one of my biggest influences personally uh, as a creator. Um, I started having Diana Wynne Jones read to me by my parents when I was probably five or six years old. And Did they, they do would, the voices? Um, not a ton of voices, but with a lot of personality. You. My folks never really did voices. I don't know, because I wasn't really too old for it. I think I was just serious. I, was a serious I kid. believe that. I believe that serious little Austin all bundled up in bed would have very like wise, serious, wide eyes listening to these magical tales of adventure. Yeah, I was all in and all on board and very critical of the of the story choices that I got. Like from a pretty young age, I remember turning down a couple books that I was like, I'm not excited about this. And I want you to read me another Dino and Jones book. <laughs> another. <laughs> I remember t- I turned down The Dark is Rising because I just couldn't get into it. And I've always meant to go back as an adult and see if uh, it was just that I wasn't old enough to appreciate it because I think I was pretty young. Yeah, I would have her stories read to me every night before bed uh, for years. They remain some of my sort of deepest wells of inspiration. And I'm always going back to read like Howl's Moving Castle or The Lives of Christopher Chan and being discovering another thing that I've taken from them. <laughs> First and foremost, thing that you have taken, at least to me, the outsider, who knows so little of Diana Wynne-Jones, 
Um, hey, that last name that you mentioned when you named a book, it sounded awfully familiar, didn't it? It did, yes. Um, <laughs> my pen name is taken in part from from Dino and Jones. Uh, the Chant family is a family of enchanters. Amazing. In um, the Christomancy <laughs> books. And I snatched it. I've actually it's been, a great I've been last called name. out about that a co- like a couple times. By strangers or by people who are like, oh, yeah, you would. Uh, both. <laughs> The other book that we're going to be talking about, or book series rather, is the Bartimaeus Sequence by Jonathan Stroud, uh, which is another series of British children's literature and was also very influential on me as a kid. Slightly older, I want to say probably eight, nine. You graduated. Yeah. Graduated. And I think the the last book came out when I was a little bit older, so they, they grew up with me a little bit. Also another one I have not read. Yeah. For... A tiny bit of context, Dino and Jones was, she passed away in 2011, I want to say off the top of my head. I'm not 100% on that, but um, a few years ago, oh my god, a lot of years ago, actually. (laughs) Oh lord, it's 2019. (laughs) I can see infinity. But yes, um, when I was in high school... She was active as a writer from the 70s to the time she died. She wrote almost entirely fantasy, a little bit of sci-fi, maybe one or two things set in the real world, but I don't, I can't think of any off the top of my head. She was really, first and foremost, a fantasy writer. She wrote a lot of very different fantasy worlds, Uh, everything from worlds that were not terribly different from our own to really far afield sort of full-on high fantasy although she tended to yeah she tended to favor stories that were set in something pretty recognizable with some twists thrown in while i'm on twists that's one of the the other defining traits of her writing very fantasy and very twisty turny a lot of plot threads being juggled all at once and then you know coming to resolve in some fantastic swirl at the end I always love rereading the ends of her books because she just picks up all of these threads that you've lapsed and you you haven't thought about in a while and just wraps them up with a bow. I don't know how you do that. Honestly, (laughs) that's one of the things I wish I'd taken away from her work more because she just, she's a puppet master with her plots. One of the books that I want to talk about today, Archer's Goon, I literally reread it four times before I could remember what the ending of the book was. It has (laughs) such a, such a twist. But yeah, uh, she primarily wrote fantasy, and so she was one of the first people I thought of when I decided I wanted to write an episode about, uh, write an episode? I guess. I do have- I guess, kind of. I have an outline, which is more than I can say for most books I've written. (laughs) Oh! (laughs) Self-burn right there. (laughs) Self-burn. I wanted to do an episode about magic systems and how to design magic systems that are really satisfying to read about, that hold together well, that are well integrated with your story, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, and basically, you know, in shorthand for me, it's interesting because I'll be able to to learn what you took and applied to your own writing. Yes. Because I'm really familiar with your writing, even though I'm not familiar with um, Stroud or Wynn Jones's, so it's going to be like, eh. yeah. I w- I would say if you're familiar with my writing, you're familiar with Dino and Jones because <laughs> I have borrowed a lot from her. She's she was a just an amazing writer. She and one of the things that I think is fabulous about her books is that they they're written for children, but they simultaneously don't talk down to children. They're often very complex, full of some pretty intense emotional themes but they're also written in a way that's very accessible they're very funny they're very plain in a lot of ways um and so the frills really come from her ideas and how well she executes them and and the wit of them they're very witty i wanted to hop right in and talk about uh howl's moving castle first because it is my favorite book of all time so i'm biased there but i think it's also a really cool twist on a lot of fantasy tropes and it has a really some really neat magic elements so howl's moving castle is one of her books that is set in an alternate world uh it is a a high fantasy setting that uh is sort of playing on a lot of tropes uh that exist in other works and has a lot of recognizable there are wizards and witches there are 
seven league boots and magic broomsticks and blah 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 sort of anything that you can you'd think of showing up in fantasy can exist there and it's sort of simultaneously playing some of those trips straight and teasing them and one of the ones that it plays on particularly is the idea of a chosen one or um, someone with a faded path the main character sophie hatter is uh, a young woman who is the eldest of three sisters. And I'm going to wind up just quoting the first line when I'm trying to explain it, so I'm just going to read it aloud. Do it. Book rustling noise. Let's get that close to the microphone. Yes, ASMR. (laughs) So the first line is, In the land of Ingri, where such things as seven league boots and cloaks of invisibility really exist, it is quite a misfortune to be born eldest of three. Everyone knows you are the one who will fail first and worst if the three of you set out to seek your fortunes. Sophie Hatter was the eldest of three sisters. She was not even the child of a poor woodcutter, which might have given her some chance of success. Her parents were well-to-do and kept a lady's hat shop. Right off the bat, you have, you know, she states her, <laughs> she states her tropes and then immediately gets to work on them. So in, in the world of Ingri, it is a very serious cultural belief that the birth order that you're in has an influence on your fate. The youngest in the family is the one who uh, is fated to be the most successful in life. If anyone's going to go on amazing adventures, marry royalty or whatever, it's going to be the youngest sibling. Middle child, probably okay. Eldest child, don't even try. What happens if you're an only child? I ask this out of pure selfishness because I am an only child. I would say, I think in the in the canon of House of Me Castle, it would probably depend on your circumstances. So again, if you were the child of a poor woodcutter, you probably got some good things over go, going on there. But huh. if your parents are okay and they and they don't die, you know, a, an assassin doesn't hunt you from the time you're born. I don't know, you might be headed for a boring existence. <laughs> I mean, I'll take boring over assassin hunts me, but That's I feel true. like I've got, I feel like as an only child with a semi-tragic past, I might break even. I think you might, you might be able to get yourself out there. Can I marry royalty with that? Or is that reserved for youngest only? Mm, good question. I mean, technically you are the youngest. It's true. You gotta crack at it. Yeah, so Sophie has... A complex about this because it is a message that has been baked into her life from the time she was young. She has accepted her place with a sort of inevitability while her sisters are going off to study magic or get an apprenticeship. She says, well, okay, I'm going to stay behind and inherit the hat shop. Make hats. I'm going to, I'm going to make, I am going to inherit the hat shop because that is the only thing I will ever be qualified to do in my life. And she winds up being cursed by a witch who comes to the hat shop, who is offended by something she says, and turned into a 90-year-old woman. At that point, she's not only the eldest of three, but she's also had her life shortened by about 70 years and has sort of lost the possibility of, like, youth and beauty and all these other factors that might win out over her fate. So she just kind of goes, okay, fuck it. I want to spend the last, like, 10 years of my life making hats or yeah she's like well and she's she doesn't want to she sort of has this like i don't want to bother with the feelings involved in this she doesn't want to deal with her family being upset so she just leaves she picks up and is like i guess i'll seek my fortune haha <laughs> mic drop might might as fucking well i mean i have to say given the givens that's a much better option than just like getting sad and crawling into bed yeah or just making making hats with your gnarled arthritic hands i feel like you know what fuck it i got five ten years i'm gonna go get a walking stick and go on some adventures does she have a walking stick she I feel gets like a she walking should... stick yes oh she finds it in a hedge Aww. and it comes back later as an important thing diana <laughs> <laughs> so she sets off into the hills above town and winds up being picked up by the moving castle of Wizard Howl, the eponymous Howl's moving castle. So why is his name Howl? Uh, his name is Howl because it is a cute uh, spelling of the name Howl, as in H-O-W-E-L-L. Oh, like Howl. Yeah. Okay. Okay, that's cute. Yeah. All right. I accept this. It's a little <laughs> twee, but I accept it. Not on Diana's part, on Howl's part. There's a lot of backstory to that. 
as well. But also people are named a lot of things like Pendragon and Yeah, yeah, you know, fantasy. Yeah, it's I don't even fantasy. know why I asked. It's a children's fantasy book. I'm like, why is the <laughs> secondary main character in this book named something a little silly? Yeah. And unusual. But yeah, so she's picked up by Howell in his moving castle, and Howell has a reputation for eating the hearts of young women. Um, so she's been terrified of the the thought of him before, but as a 90-year-old woman is just like, again, fuck it. What's he gonna yeah, do? Yeah, chew on this one. Yeah. yeah. It's, I'm not, it's tough I'm not and bitter. Some young lady. Come at me. Yeah. <laughs> it already was, but it's more so now. I'm gonna have to sous vide that shit. Is it sous vide that makes it all like tender? That weird um, cooking method? I don't know, if I'm being honest. We're gonna have to we're gonna have to slow roast it. Yeah. We're gonna have to give it a nice tenderizing rub. Yeah. I'm really fixated on this heart eating thing. I'm sorry. Nasty. <laughs> so she bullies her way into Howell's household because she has nowhere else to go and winds up making a deal with the demon who lives in Howell's fireplace and keeps the castle. A animates it, but also like keeps it warm, etc. It's a big old clunky castle that he, uh, Calcifer the demon, will lift the curse that is on her if she uh, finds a way to free him from the fireplace. Also, I just feel like even though it seems like a helpful demon who's just chilling in the fireplace, deals with demons. He's extremely conniving, so yeah, it's not like a great plan. But again, she's kind of like, okay. She's like, well, you know what? What am I going to do with the last ten years of my life? Make a deal with a demon? (laughs) Absolutely. We should all have our lives shortened (laughs) completely so that we go out and make very (laughs) ill-advised bargains. Do you have any idea how much debt I would be in if I found out I was dying in five years? Oh my god. Oof. Yeah, I don't want to. I won't summarize the whole book, but. Needless to say, a lot of it is about her relationship with Howell, um, with her as this sort of ill-tempered housekeeper, bullying herself sort of into this role, and him being this young, flamboyant, sort of asshole wizard who goes around not literally eating people's hearts, but repeatedly falling in love with young women and then breaking their hearts. And the relationship between them is, is one of my favorite relationships in fiction. And one of the things that's really neat about it is that Howell is known as this, like, extremely powerful wizard. He doesn't use his powers for anything useful. He avoids that whenever possible. Same. But you realize as the book goes on that Sophie is also an extremely powerful witch. But because she has had this concept her entire life that nothing she ever does will be interesting and that she is doomed to failure, the ways that her magic expresses itself are subconscious you realize ultimately like that she is working these really like badass spells like quite often doing really interesting things weird stuff just happens sometimes when she's not intending it to because it just sort of slips out um, when she's feeling things strongly or when she is sort of imagining possibilities she's she literally sort of seems to have the ability to like alter fates and bring life to inanimate objects all this kind of stuff one of my favorites is this is a bit of a spoiler but it's also a very minor detail you find out that hats that she's been making um she talks to them because she's lonely all of the hats that she's put out into the world have come with these incredibly powerful charms on them so there's like one hat that she feels sorry for because doesn't look very good Um, And so she tells it that it has a heart of gold and someone amazing will see it and recognize it and fall in love with them. And she gives it to this young woman who has a weird hairstyle and who everyone makes fun of in the village. And then a prince falls in love with her. Yeah, so she has this like, it's either like an extremely powerful love spell or like a fate altering ability, but she doesn't recognize it. It isn't like she's doing it with intention. And also, how would she know that the lady with the funny haircut it married the royalty because of her hat. Like, yeah. how did, how is she going to put that together? Also, I imagine if she was having a bad day, she would create some real fucked up hats. Yeah, probably. Well, and she creates, at one point later, she's working in a flower shop and she creates, like, poison weed killer mm. one day instead of making the flowers grow because she's in a bad mood. The, the magic as it works in Howl's Moving Castle is kind of exemplary of, of the way that Diana Wynne Jones tended to write magic. And that is that it is an expression of the person wielding it. So Sophie's magic comes out in all these ways because she has no sort of conscious understanding of her own power. And it comes out in these sort of wistful, like fantastic ways 
where she's imagining things and making them happening, or they're very emotional. They have a sort of internal consistency to them, like not, she can do a lot of different kinds of things, but they happen in sort of similar ways. She talks to things and weird things happen. She imagines possibilities that then come true in some shape or form. And that's really at the heart of how Diana Jones writes magic. It is not about a cool, it's not, or rather I should say, it's not just about a cool concept for magic. It's about a cool concept for magic that also reflects back on the person doing it. So it tells you as much about the character as it does the magic itself. So what kind of magic did Howl do? Because you said he was a powerful wizard. (laughs) Yes, um, Howl is an extremely avoidant person whose primary motivation in life is to escape responsibilities, slither out of uh, his obligations, despite having all of this sort of you know, incredible power that causes people to come after him all the time. Like the king is seeking after him to try to get him to go to war, to aid him in the war effort. And Howell is doing his best to avoid that. And so he, most of his magic manifests in disguise spells, in cosmetics. He's very vain. And he also likes to change his appearance constantly, which is part of his sort of disappearance. Like he has shops in a bunch of different places, but he pretends to be different people in different Mm. places. Like... People don't realize that Great Wizard such and such is the same as Terrible Wizard Howl. He appears very differently in different places. He has bathrooms full of like different spells that he's concocted for hair dye and so on and so forth. That's so cool. And a lot of the like the spells in his closet, like he has a bunch of disguises, ways of traveling very quickly (laughs) to get away from people. (laughs) Um, And in fact, the curse, there's a curse that has been laid on him, which is such that his his beha- his pattern of behavior of constantly falling in love with people and then jilting them is actually a curse that has been laid on him because he jilted someone so he has this curse laid on him that he will constantly be falling like madly desperately in love with someone and courting them and then the moment they reciprocate dumping them oh man that's rough the moment someone somebody loves him back he can't love them and then he's on to the next. Ooh, no yeah. wonder. And it isn't like, like it's it's genuine for him. Well, you know, which is magically induced, but Yeah, it's magically induced genuine. Like he he does fall in love with them and does then lose all interest in them. But I th- I thought that was a really it's an interesting way of sort of making magic out of a personality trait that is really unfortunate as well. Yeah, and it's also a nice subversion of the the like Beauty and the Beast trope, which is like you have to get someone to fall in love with you for the curse to be broken. You're the minute someone falls in love with you, you're all through this vicious cycle again, motherfucker. Yeah, your curse is that you can't break out of this really unhealthy pattern. Toxic. Yeah, that's really cool. And then the other thing that Howl's Moving Castle does that I think is really cool and that she does in a lot of her books is not only are individual people, not in only is magic sort of built around the protagonists and and their personalities and their flaws and their strengths, but so too is magic about the cultures that they live in. Sophie's um, opinion of herself and the the cultural climate that she has grown up in is in a very similar way, almost a curse that is laid on her as well. Her bone deep belief and the belief of those around her that she is doomed to failure because she is the eldest is something that has doomed her to yeah totally constrained her life until she is pushed to a point where it's like, well, screw it. Yeah, what have I got to lose? Again, that's a thing that is a very true character trait that is sort of heightened in this story, but that also pings something very real. The like belief that you are doomed to failure and that nothing will ever work out for you is not one that's necessarily unfamiliar to just like people in general. (laughs) And I think it says a lot about like people who are sort of broken down by society and convinced that they don't, that their uh, life is not going to have value. Yeah, the self-fulfilling prophecy. Oof. And this is something that comes up in her books a lot is both deeply held beliefs uh, are magical in nature or that are combined with magic. So you have, for example, The Magicians of Caprona, which is one of the books in the Christomancy sequence, which is about a alternate history Italy where Italy is still uh, warring states. And in the city of Caprona, at least, all magic is sung. (laughs) Um, And it's a very family-based cultural practice. So the families grow up singing together. 
and singing harmonies and working magic together in these choirs. And it's kind of a Romeo and Juliet situation. It's about two warring families and then two of the children from those families stuck together and falling into want, harmonious love. Far, fully, yeah, falling into harmoniousness. They're also a major plot of the book is trying to find this lost song that can help protect the city from the warring states. Yeah, it's a it's a really neat concept, but again, it's not just a neat concept, it's woven through into the characters and how they experience family and how they experience rivalries and loves at everything. It's really worked through and thought through to its logical conclusion, which is something I really like that she does a lot. So basically she wrote a story where everybody in that city is just a bard. Yes. it's uh, That's got to be real annoying. It's a world of bards. <laughs> oh, that's got to be brutal. I mean, I, I imagine, I think that this could go, th- this is my, this is my theory. I'm surprised this wasn't made into a movie because presumably this is also a children's aimed novel. It is indeed. Um, and it's got a really cool idea at the core of it. So you would assume that like Disney or whatever would option it. And I feel like either it would have a wonderful rousing score or it would be fucking unwatchable. Yeah. And I can't decide which of those would be more enjoyable to watch. <laughs> <laughs> she actually, um, just like, sidebar, really she only wrote, I think, two adult novels. I mean, she was killing the game. Why would she need to branch out of her fave? Yeah. Uh, those are, there There may have been another one, but the ones I know of are Deep Secret and The Tough Guide to Fantasyland. And The Tough Guide to Fantasyland is actually, has two children's slash young adult novels set in that world. And they're both really fucking grim. So thanks, Diana. <laughs> Again, she did not I, gee, I wonder. I wonder why baby Austin liked Diana Wynne Jones so much. <laughs> Serious, weird baby Austin. Yeah, speaking of grim things, uh, my other favorite novel by her is The Lives of Christopher Chant, which I mentioned. Yes, yes. Uh, the Lives of Christopher Chant is about the man who, or the boy who grows up to be the main character in the rest of the books, or not the main character, sort of the magical Poirot. He's a um, interdimensional traveler who goes to other planes of existence to solve magical conflicts. Oh, that's so good. This is sort of a, it's a world where there's a string of related worlds that have minor divergent timelines. They've basically all been created by, you know, divergent timelines that have created something really different. He lives in sort of an alternate London uh, where magic is pretty commonplace and it's where the Christomancies. Uh, live and govern and travel around to solve magical conflicts. And Christopher Chant... What? Sorry, what's a Christomancy? I know that's the name of the series. Oh, Christomancy is the title of the magic Poirot who travels around to solve problems. Is he the only one? Yes, there's one at a time. Oh, okay. So like there have been more, there will be more, but there's only one at a time. There can only be one! And they are the always uh, enchanters who have nine lives. Uh, like well kids. i mean hence the name yeah but also how like a cat yes so christopher chant when we meet him is a little boy who lives in a very neglectful household uh, his parents are very much at odds mostly split up very rich just constantly fighting and ignoring him he's and and they pretty much only pay attention to him to sort of drag him into their conflicts they're so awful that servants won't stay so he's raised by like a rotating door of governesses and maids none of whom stay long enough to form much of a connection with him so he really has no real adult figures in his life to nurture him and he grows up weird (laughs) (laughs) Um, weird and lonely it's we see very little of him having a life like outside of his house so it's like him in his nursery no other children no real adults. And he has a really neat magic that he that he works that, again, is subconscious. You don't realize that it's magic at first, and he does not realize it's magic at first, where he has the ability to dream walk into other worlds, escape from the life in his nursery, so he can walk into all the other related worlds, and he goes on adventures, and he meets people, and he brings back these fantastic toys that they give him. He basically just has a, a wonderful time, and he seems to live more there than he does well, yeah. in the real world. 
Good God, yeah. You meet people who are actually nice and not like <laughs> yeah. fighting all the time and they give you toys. Yeah. I'd never wake up. Like, everywhere this would he be goes, some inception like, shit. Oh, this little boy who's like here alone will take care of him and like feed him and Aww. take him to hang out with mermaids and all this stuff. Aww. Yeah, and I love this. I love the premise of this book so much because it's A, it's a cool concept. Again, dream walking into other worlds, very neat. But what makes it unique is how much it feels like a natural extension of a very neglected child who lives mostly in a fantasy world. Yeah, because, it feels like a coping mechanism. Yeah, exactly. Magic is his coping mechanism. And it just, it tells you so much about who he is and about his circumstances. A big part of his character arc is learning to still use his magic and his imagination while living in the real world and having friends and learning how to relate to people who aren't magic From strangers that he meets in yeah. his dreams. <laughs> Finding things that are worth being a part of in the real world, coming into his own in that way. It's it's a really perfect blending of those two concepts. I think there's something really just tender and a little ouchy about it because I don't know if this is the case for you, but you know, as an introvert and a creative person who when I experience strife or trauma or just have a bad day, my first impulse is escapism. And sometimes that means being an introvert. And sometimes that means immersion in your own better fantasy. And the fact that this was like real and necessary for him, because otherwise he probably I mean, I can't imagine what he would have grown up like had he not had that escape. And the fact that it's so tied to being a literal coping mechanism is just, ooh. Yeah. <laughs> it hurts it's, a little. It's meaningful on every level. And that's what I love so much about her stories is that she weaves that into her magic systems over and over again. They're not just a cool idea. They are yeah. this cool concept bound to the person for whom it makes sense. So yeah. you there's no separation between the character and the magic. They're just seamlessly part of you know one concept. One of my other favorite examples um, is Eight Days of Luke, which is a a weird <laughs> sort of Norse mythology novel. Okay, Diana. Okay, Diana. Eight Days of Luke is about uh, a boy named David who um, meets a boy named Luke in his backyard, and they become best friends. Uh, and David is another neglected kid with weird relations. And by the way, very much like definitely reflective of some of her real life. She writes a lot about the psychology and coping mechanisms of, of kids in weird family situations, which I definitely related to as a kid. Um, I love that. Yeah, almost all of her main characters have some kind of weird family dynamic going on. <laughs> this is this has turned into a full-on sidebar, but she started becoming a storyteller in her words because she was telling stories to her little sisters to tide them over through some weird family situations and also because their parents were like really stingy with books. Oh. So she was like, fine. <laughs> I'll, I'll make up them. my own. So anyway. I'll parent my my <laughs> little sisters. If you won't do it. Yeah. So David meets Luke while he's in sort of a, it actually reminds me a lot of the beginning of Harry Potter, like Harry home with the Dursleys kind of vibes. Oh, yeah. Um, he's home from school and, and miserable. And then he meets this uh, boy named Luke. And it's Luke is exciting and fun. And they're going to do adventurous stuff together. And David is not magic, but Luke is very magic. Luke is has the ability to start fires that is his primary expression and things related to fire light sparks that kind of thing and i love so much the way this book develops because it gives you this it, it's a, about this fantastic thing but it's rooted in the feeling of meeting someone new and being really attra uh, attracted and attached to them and then realizing that there's something off about them and this sort of internal dissonance between I like this person and there's something about them that scares me and something that has the potential to really hurt someone. They're out shopping together at one point and, and Luke sets a building on fire because David is bored and he wants to entertain him. That escalated him. quickly. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like it gets very real. <laughs> you know, David is sort of realizing that like there is a lot going on with Luke that he can't necessarily totally control. And I just, it's so much more visceral for that. Again, it's not just an exciting concept. It is... So much this feeling of being a, a young person 
biting off a little more than you can chew Mm -hmm. with a new person that you've met. And the feeling of loving someone and also being scared of them. And it's just really visceral, I think is the right word. It stuck with me. And it's really the feelings of these books that, that sticks with me. The the magic and the world building is just a mechanism to shove feels down your throat. Well, and it's funny because she's such a plotty writer and her books are, you know, full of these amazing plot twists and turns, but they have such a vulnerable, vulnerable emotional core that gives you so much more than that. Even some of her really more plot-focused books like uh, The Dark World... Oh, bleh. <laughs> like the Dark World? <laughs> the Dark Lord of Dirkholm, which is... Uh, one of her probably grimmest books. It is about a, like, our world basically crashed magically into a traditional high fantasy world that is riffing off of and making fun of a lot of high fantasy tropes. <laughs> our world has sort of made a theme park out of the fantasy world. They send tours through it pretty regularly, and the tours are extremely destructive to the fantasy world. They are often violent. They consume a ton of natural resources, and they also require, like, the fantasy society to sort of be twisted into something palatable and exciting over and over and over again, torn down and rebuilt over and over based on, like, what the tours feel like doing in their world. So, like, Westworld, but real. Yes, it's very Westworldy, which is again, it's like a, it's like a children's book. <laughs> Fucking upsetting. <laughs> Diana Wynne Jones, Westworld for children. Buckle <laughs> yeah. up, tots. <laughs> and it's about uh, the main character is the guy who is um, assigned to be the Dark Lord, who will be slain at the end by the tours. It's about him and his family trying to cope with the things that they're being forced to do and just manage it from like a bureaucratic standpoint they have to have the same little groups of tourists basically come in and have the same experience over and over again and eat all their food and drink all their beer and even do stuff like burn down villages like they're it's just extremely destructive so the concept of this could just be a joke haha what if the fantasy world was a tourist destination and i think you there are writers who would write it like that but instead of that she takes this sort of wild whimsical concept and then grounds it in some really grim commentary on like colonialism <laughs> and the violence of seeing other people as entertainment all of this stuff like it it's very grim at its heart because it takes itself seriously i think that's something that her stories do really really well is she tends to take pretty whimsical weird concepts but 100% commits to the people in them experiencing them like they are true, which is something that I think particularly children's literature doesn't always do a great job of. And I think that that is what the quote that I read at the beginning of this exemplifies is like, she is making stuff up, but for the characters in it, it is real. And There's whatever no emotions are brought out of that are going to be real. So the, the other novel that I wanted to talk to is just sort of builds on that. Uh, the Bartimaeus series by Jonathan Stroud is an alternate history set in around 2000. But it is an alternate history where, for one thing, magic exists. Sweet. Yeah. Well, sort of. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> dun, dun, dun. I should have known better. Yeah. Magic exists, but humans don't possess it. Magic is is practiced by spirits of various types who are known in the world as demons, jinn, etc. And humans practice magic by summoning and binding spirits to various tasks, whether that be something like, you know, making them into a servant or all magic items in this world. And there are a lot like magic mirrors, magic amulets, etc., etc. They are all created by taking a spirit and binding them inside it forever so there's just so, like a, a magical fork that's just got a sad gin in it who has probably been in it for a really long time and oh, man. is very upset and very fully sentient it's just like i'm in a mouth again i hate this i fucking I don't like this. humans this is the worst 
And title of this episode, I'm in a mouth again. I hate this. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so it's it's very much about that, um, because the main character, Bartimaeus, is a spirit who has been summoned by a horrible 12-year-old boy to do his <laughs> bidding. But it's also very much about classism and empires and power structures and how they keep certain people on top, because magicians in this world have created over and over throughout history horrible ruling classes where they control not only power but knowledge they're the only ones who know how to work magic because they keep it to themselves and to actually like summon and bind the spirits without them killing you requires these incredibly elaborate rituals part of the reason that the spirits want to kill them is that the spirits are again fully sentient and for thousands and thousands of years have been being summoned and enslaved by the same shitty people I mean, yeah, that is a good case for, like, fuck humans, though. Yeah. Like, nah, let's not. They've created this horrible system, this this horrible, like, basically a caste system, and they keep enslaving us, and also I keep going into mouths and I don't like it. Let's burn it down. Yeah, there's an implication that, like, most of the major empires in history have been built on this kind of a system and that they've eventually fallen apart because of popular revolt against the magicians like Rome is implied to have been one of these civilizations, <laughs> then it is about the decline of the British Empire, which in this alternate history, like, has been propped up by oh. magic being um, held in the in the hands of, of, of a few. But it, that's coming to an end. But the British Empire has extended into the 21st century in this world and has subjugated the Americas and fucked up europe really bad and it's implied to have been that way for a very long time yeah not, more that, reason. Like, not that that <laughs> a lot of that didn't happen in <laughs> real life but um, it kind India. of gets into how that kind of a extra power structure would could be turned to very terrible purposes and that's what i think that's what binds us back to Dino and Jones and how she constructs magic systems is that there's a real sense that magic doesn't have to be this way in this world like clearly it doesn't and it, it is in fact about some of the people who have done things differently why this sucks so bad and why it shouldn't be this way obviously it's from the perspective of someone who wishes very much that it was not this way <laughs> it gives you a sense of like this is a magic system that was built by human hands was informed by the worst instincts of people it tells you a lot about the people who do it and the kind of people who would think okay, it's fine. I'm just going to trap a living thing inside of a box for 4,000 years. That's fine as long as I get a powerful magic item out of it. So it's about magic, sort of, but Jonathan Stroud really just uses magic as a vehicle to talk about all this stuff that is real um, and relevant to people in the real world, while also telling a fantastic story with a really well thought out system that is, again, the concepts of it are carried through, and it never lets you forget the real emotional weight of every aspect of this system, people affected by it. It never lets you forget that a magic object is something that was created in this incredibly violent and horrible way. It, because that is the, the core of this, the fact that it is about the exploitation of people and natural resources and how that is an extension of empire, it commits to that fully and it makes sure that you remember all the time, which I think is the mark of a really well thought out system. It doesn't have to be fucked up, but you should fully think through what it means for magic to be this way. It should be surprising, too. The revelation that Sophie was actually casting in immense charms on her hats. I, don't, I haven't read the book, so I don't know if it happens super gradually, but like, is that a moment where you're just like, oh, holy shit? It, yeah, it pops out at you sort of like, oh, Wow, Everything but it also makes, makes sense. sense. It, yeah. it reorders things without appending them. It, yes. it it twists it around so you you see things in a new light. That, I think, is one of the things that's also great about the Bartimaeus series because it introduces you to all these recognizable tropes but then makes you think really hard about how things are produced. Like, on a, on a basic level, it makes you think about what goes into creating the cool shit in your life and who is impacted by that how deeply like exploitation is woven into power structures that privilege certain people above others and honestly just manufacturing goods for other people to use 
Yeah. The amount of sweatshop labor we still rely on and just unethical sourcing and shit. There's obvious parallels there. And it pulls those things out, not in a way that feels preachy, but just feels like, hey, we're talking about a real thing, you know, <laughs> and we're we're taking it as seriously as we would if we were talking about something that was actually happening, because something is actually happening. And I think that's a really powerful quality in any sort of fantastic construction, whether you're talking about fantasy or sci-fi. One of the most common errors I see in magic systems, and your mileage may vary on, on how much you like or dislike this, but something that frustrates me and puts me off of magic systems is when they feel arbitrary and when they feel based on sort of a rule of cool rather than something that feels organic, something that evolves out of characters or culture or choices that people make. I think the most interesting magic systems are the ones that really permeate the worlds they're in and are shaped by it. Magic is not just something that happens, it is something that is shaped by people. Because if you take it as sort of a raw power, different people are going to turn that to totally different ends. And if you look at any real thing, that is how it works. Everybody eats food, but people around the world eat food very differently based on cultural precedent and the resources available and scarcity or plenty, depending on what class they're in. And everybody, I mean, not everybody, but a lot of people use the internet, but we all use it for slightly different means and goals. Or if you look at the history of art, if you look at the different ways that people paint, the different ways that people do textiles, these things all have immense variety and they're also immensely shaped by... I don't know why this in particular jumped out at me, but I was just watching, uh, I've been watching a lot of the Great British Baking Show, and they were talking about a traditional food that is made the way it's made because egg whites were used in the laundry process, and so they had all these extra egg yolks in like particular religious ceremonies, and so they made confections primarily out of egg yolks. And that's that's one of those things that like, I want magic to be like that. I want magic to be something that is used in certain ways, not just because it's magic, but because of the resources and the culture that it grows out of. You just want magic to be egg yolks. I want magic to be egg yolks. Yeah, honestly, at the end of the day, I want it to be something that is not, not just flourish. a force that exists. I don't want it to be sort of just a thing that is brought down from on high, like magic just happens. So earlier in the show, I basically said, because I'm unfamiliar with Diana Wynne-Jones and is it Jonathan Stroud, that I am not familiar with them. I'm maybe going to learn some things about you and the things that you have employed in your own writing. And this is my, these are my very uneducated or I guess half educated <laughs> guesses. Um, obviously, you took a lot from the lives of Christopher Chant and his escape from neglect and one would assume like general misery into a dream world that turns out to be literal really mm. reminds me of peter darling <laughs> just a little it's bit it's almost like that it's almost like that and i really like that they shape both peter and hook shape neverland in different ways we have talked about this too during the editing process but peter sees neverland as a fun romp time where he can beat up anything like it's his version of an id fantasy is just like aggression, childish games, and Hook's id fantasy is just his best gay pirate life. Yes, very much so. I definitely drew a ton of inspiration from the lives of Christopher Chance specifically for that book. There is actually a, a cheeky little reference to Christopher Chant in um, Peter Darling, where the way that another minor character accesses Neverland is the same way that Peter, uh, that Peter, <laughs> that Christopher Chant accesses his dream world. Hmm. And it Ernest? goes around the corner in his bedroom and um, wakes up and wakes up in Neverland. But yeah, I mean, that's something that I think it probably was the, the like going into a dreamland that first made that connection for me. Because that's how Christopher Chant opens. And then in Peter Pan, you have the like second star on the right. You have this sort of ritualistic way of going out of your world. And it's real, but you can also come back. Yeah, I, I drew a huge amount from that and from the idea of needing to go somewhere where you could self-determine. Experience yourself in a different way and then bring that back. Bring that to, to the real world where you can actually... Well, not the real world. Bring that back to your world where you can live 
um, as yourself. Yeah. Your and best self. The other book that I think I can admit to a lot of parallels to is that um, Caroline's heart drew a, a huge amount from Howl's Moving Castle. Yeah. And you had a very strong idea of how you were going to build the magic in that book because we had discussions about, like, I threw some cool things at you that you could do with the house and like expressing how the house or the attic was sort of changing things, how it had a, an almost on, ominous will of its own. And you were like, yeah, those are fine, but they're not what I'm going for. And It actually it was, does have an ominous will of its own, but... No, no, I just, the things that I, were, I was suggesting to express that weren't oh, gotcha, quite gotcha. what you wanted, yeah. Almost there. I don't know. I'm sorry I, that I inter interrupted you then. It's fine. <laughs> that book went through so many different versions that I was like, do Amanda and I remember the same version? Who fucking knows <laughs> at this point? It also reminds me of this really random detail that for some reason I've always remembered. So in the third Harry Potter film, which was directed by Al Blah, Alfonso Cuaron. <laughs> yep. I couldn't even say Alfonso without my mouth sliding out of itself. He obviously brought a lot of his own touches and shook up the existing aesthetic style of the series because it had been previously directed by sort of noted children's director, Christopher, uh, Chris Columbus. Saying Christopher Cr Columbus sounds weird yeah. <laughs> um, by Chris Columbus. So he was adding in all these touches. And if you've seen it, you know, like the, the kids didn't wear robes as much. Even some of the layout of Hogwarts changed. It was just overall aesthetically quite different. And one of the things he wanted to add was a scene where there were, I don't know if they were fairies or just miniature people who were jumping around on a piano to play it. And JKR said to Al Alfonso, like, that's a really cute idea and I like the visual, but it doesn't exist in the world. And it has no purpose outside of that scene. For all of my... <laughs> For all of the, the things I have found to criticize about JKR, that was one of those moments um, where I was like, you have to know the difference between a cool idea and something that actually has significance and resonance in your plot. You know, sometimes it can be frustrating as, as an editor or even as a writer who's trying to fix your own work to be like, but I have this idea and I know that it needs to be in here. I just don't know how to do it. Yeah. And or you're like really attached to something. Say I was editing Caroline's Heart and you were really attached to the little people jumping on the piano. <laughs> and I'd be like, Austin, no, you don't need this. It's a cute. You remember the fucking talking sharks, whales? There were talking sharks in Peter Darling originally and Amanda did make me get rid of them. I, I made you get rid of them because they on a podcast before. We did on THR. I made you get rid of them because one, I laughed and two, they never were going to come back again. They never did. Like, There's talking sharks. Why are you doing this to me? <laughs> in fairness to me, I think it was that Peter could talk to the sharks, not that they like spoke English. Yes, yes. But I that's yes, very true. No. But I was still like, there's literal talking sharks right now. And I need you to not do that. I need you to, to not do this. Not be, I need you not to be not so twee. Punish not me today. with these sharks. And it was a good choice. Yeah, it was fine. And I mean, honestly, it was only like two paragraphs. It was an easy cut. Example of sometimes you don't need those flourishes. That shot of the little tiny people jumping up and down on the piano. What would that have been? Five seconds? Yeah. That is just, maybe it makes you happy for a second. Or maybe it's a nice image. But it has, and what does that say about the world? Like, are those little people real? Are they, do they have a job? Is this their job? Do they go home? Do, do they live at Hogwarts? <laughs> do they go into some cabinet after? Are they just charmed? Like, what is the situation here? Sometimes it can be frustrating to follow that line of investigation to its natural conclusion, because if you really do want to include the little, little people jumping on the piano, it's hard to be like, well, that doesn't make any fucking sense. <laughs> yeah. I liked it, my that idea. That was something but... that came up a lot with Caroline's Heart, where um, the sort of menace that is building in the back of the story, I had strong feelings about not wanting it to be... I had strong feelings about the spiritualism of what that really was and how it could manifest. I remember turning down a lot of suggestions from both from myself and from other people. This was something that I was having to figure out as well of forms of it being like menacing or creepy that just didn't make sense because that wasn't what that thing was giving it like certain expressions of malice while they might be effectively scary didn't make sense for what i knew to be true about that thing and i turned down also a lot of i originally was very slapdash with sort of the way that cecily the the witch main character worked magic i originally was just like cool ideas for things that she works with her characters that she makes prosthetics and she works magic in a way that is very 
unique to her because all witches kind of do in this world. It's, it's the materials they use and sort of every component of their magic tends to come from what elements appeal to them and what materials have meaning to them. And so I had this very slapdash array of uh, were like cute, cool bird skulls and blah, blah, blah. At a certain point, I had to sit down and think like, no, like she just... She doesn't just use like random shit because it has some sort of arcane meaning to the reader. She uses specific material components because they are meaningful to her and they remind her of important things. And because she has the ability to sense the power that's in them because of her. Yeah. As much as because of them. And I think that's that was a really important distinction to make for me was I'm not just going to have her use something because traditionally maybe that's a spell component. I'm going to have her use specific things because of how they appeal to her and how they make the magic for her. And you also didn't go in the opposite direction and say, what are some things that you don't typically see in spell components? You just went, what is the natural conclusion of her personality and her that would cause her to look for spell components? It wasn't like, no one's ever used an eyeshadow palette in a spell <laughs> component before. That will be cool. Yeah. Anyway, not to toot my own horn too much because... I don't want to. It's I nice think, to look at it as a practical level. like how. Yeah, the- on, a, on a practical level, like this is a technique that I very much learned from Diana Wynne Jones and that I think is maybe not for every story or for every writer, but I think if you're looking for ways to sort of make things feel more real, I think this is a really cool way to do it. So that's going to do it for us this week on The Red Pen. We hope you've enjoyed this discussion of magic systems. And as always, if you would like to continue the conversation, you can find us on Twitter. We are at the red pen pod or red pen pod no that red pen pod <laughs> and i am on my personal twitter at austin chanted and i'm at amanda h Jean. and you can also if you are so inclined support us on patreon it really helps us continue producing the show uh and you can get all kinds of fun extras you can uh pay us to talk about anything you would like us to talk about for example there are lots of bloopers because we fuck up a lot yeah and other fun bits like that you will also just get our undying gratitude and affection fun bits of stuff (laughs) good lord i'm so hoarse (laughs) recording is hard especially when you go don't get a drink of water first and that's my final tip (laughs) drink water drink water as you construct your magic systems Thank you so much for listening, and as always, if you love something, cut it up.